So welcome everyone to today's uh, patron uh, critique hour. I'm going to be taking a look at stuff from um, just general critique of some work that you guys handed in. Sometimes outside of the submissions of our themes, uh, we, we, we can't, just within the submissions, we can't see certain issues a student is dealing with because when you're exploring a masterpiece, which is where we find our major issues, uh, we tend to look over the underlying issues and the underlying uh, mistakes that are found that reveal a lot about fundamental misunderstanding or missing fundamentals. Uh, so it's easy to critique one full illustration and not focus on the eye, but if we were to focus on how a student is painting the eye, we could find as many mistakes as there are in the general illustration. When we strip away the color, when we strip away like all of the fineries, what's left is just the raw form. And if it still works and still reads without all of that accessory, then obviously the student has skill. But a lot of the time students mask from each other and from themselves how limited their understanding of the fund of, they may be familiar with it, they may even write notes about it, they may even be able to teach other students about it, but to be able to recreate it in work is close to impossible for them uh, to recreate it in the same way that they understand it. It's like you see a perfect eye in your mind, but being able to transfer that perfect eye through your arm, through a paper, um, then <laughs> Yeah, yes, there is an echo, Anton. I've said multiple times to mute your Google Hangout. Audio is only Discord, and video is only Hangout. So make sure your um, Hangout is muted. There shouldn't be an echo, I am muted, but somehow you're not muted, or somehow you hear me. What was I saying? We want to, I want to look at some of these pieces that are outside of the masterpiece and some of the pieces that are, of course, in the so-called masterpieces that we aim for. So with every submission for the patron hangouts, uh, what I do is I assign one photo reference that tests a student's ability to transfer information, um, either with eyeballing or any other measurement tools such as trending, uh, trend lines and traceover diagram lines, um, or uh, a, a creative assignment that tests their ability to create, to generate, to think about mapping and blueprinting. We talked a lot about that last class and how important it is to map. I've covered that as much as I can in the public sessions that I hope you guys are taking advantage of um, because coupled together um, focus stuff on you and then general stuff where you see other people making the same mistakes is an invaluable resource for you. So make sure that you're taking advantage of seeing other people's issues. They might be the exact same issues you have and it might help you observe yourself a little bit better outside of a you know critique hour or being able to critique yourself on your own which is which is very very important to learn. All right so what I'm going to do is start off as they come. Um, one of the assignments was uh, to work from a photo reference piece obviously and the photo reference piece was either uh, this one or uh, this one. Um, so the assignment was to perfect your ability to block. Uh, so the point is to show me your edge work and the stages of your painting that lead to the final finished piece. Please pick from the references below to study from. You were also supposed to watch the what are edges, the blocking in edge work and workflow, having designated edges for every single plane that you're going to experience. And I think this is one of the best submissions we have today because it really illustrates exactly what we're talking about, the negative versus positive space here, um, and then the midtones in between and where they're set up, and then the mapping and trend lines. And what you have as a result is some beautiful uh, accuracy. So who among you, if you can respond uh, with the chat or you can unmute yourselves if you need to, uh, who among you found that after applying all these measurement systems and watching the video and being very, very attentive to your work, were surprised by the quality of your uh, results. Who of, who of you here have uh, been surprised by how well you did? Uh, I've been pretty surprised, yeah. Yeah, that's really I, good. I think um, measuring in this way and blocking out has helped a lot in terms of just getting a likeness and the accuracy that's, along with the values as well. That's amazing. I'm so happy to hear that. A lot of there's this, this massive stigma about whether or not you should measure, whether or not that references should even be used, and a student has to shake that off as quickly as possible. So that's why all these assignments are so dedicated on 
uh, helping you in a sandbox environment learn how to perfect your measurement because one day you're going to not need them anymore and your eyeballing will be a, you know, will have real foundation and mileage behind it and you can't learn to eyeball without actually manually measuring first for a while and for a while meaning at least six months of measurement one of these days you're going to realize you can skip it you're going to skip it unconsciously you're not going to notice you're skipping measurement but you will have accurate measurements and that's how you develop uh, unblocking uh, i mean sorry that's how you develop blocking without measurement um kira says uh you yourself as well have experienced like a surprising quality in your uh, submission um can you elaborate a little bit <clears throat> it went the other way for me i only did a few measurements and that made it a little bit more difficult for me a lot of, I understand that completely. A lot of students are so comfortable in their environment. They're so comfortable with the way they have uh, their photos set up with their painting that to become so interactive with the photograph, what happens is that you completely disconnect from your usual workflow, your usual desktop environment, your usual dashboard. And that's just a learning curve. That's not a sign that measurement didn't work for you. Measurement is going to work. It's, it's an objective way to attain information, attain like intel on what you're going to be dealing with, what the, what, what, where the likeness is, the likeness is in measurement, the symmetry is in measurement, the anatomy is in measurement, um, and making sure that you have all of that intact. This is all universal sciences, all universal biology. So there's nothing about measurement that's going to make your work look worse, but at changing the way your workflow is just like you know taking a new path with your bike or walking down a new path, you're not used to it. Um, and it's just going to take you some time to get used to it and become familiar with your surroundings. But don't give up on it. Um, I'm happy that you were more honest with your experience and saying that eh, it didn't really help me. But if you were to just survive it a little bit longer, you'll notice that you definitely are improving. There is a quality in your work that's coming back. The better you get, the harder it is to improve. And it's always in the details. It's always in the fine measurements. So some of the stuff that you missed here in this piece, uh, let me just see some more. I deleted the painting because I felt uh, like I was cheating doing trend lines and I failed to meet the deadline because I sliced my arm open too much. Oh my gosh. Anton, <laughs> they're so intense. <laughs> I'm so sorry that you went through that. I'm, I know I'm laughing, but I'm, I'm really sorry. It's just you're so random. <laughs> I hope you're okay. I hope you didn't slice it too deep. Oh my gosh. Um, no, it's not cheating. It's not cheating at all. Um, it's not cheating. It, it Cheating would be to say that you did not use measurement and that these are your um, free hand measurements and these are your eyeballing skills. That's cheating. When you say I use this with a degree of measurement, this is, this is what professionals do all the time. Let me just uh, put that matter to rest. One of my more favorite artists um, on, uh, that, that works so well with their, let me just find them, with their photographs and everyone is like, oh wow, he uses photographs. But he's some of the best uh, that I've ever seen in my life um, and he's just right here uh, so let me find my favorite piece of his and you can see that he's using trend lines minimally obviously because he's a professional he, professional now he needs to use them less but these are trend lines as you can see and then this is the piece that we're that he's uh, instructing on do you see how he manages to maintain likeness even through all the texture, all of the excessive brushwork? In my opinion, it's excessive, but he just he just manages to curve the brush grain across the contours and still use the texture, still keep the texture there, but it's still serving a scientific purpose as if to show the wiring on the form. So he doesn't just leave a flat brush mark going down. He, he sculpts it around the face and all of this stuff is still working somehow because if we were to get rid of all of the good measurements and just leave behind like really beginner level measurement, this wouldn't work. But because his measurements are so accurate, he can do whatever he wants with the stylization, with the texture, with the unusual combination of pure blending and pure smudging and pure, pure brush feed, um, high, high texture, which is something that he does a lot. And this, these are his trend lines. This is him managing exactly where all of the emotions go and where all of it to capture the most likeness. This is what appealed to him, what captured him most out of his references. The length of the neck that he exaggerated, the straight lines from the hair, the upward tilt, the position of the chin, all of that is what, you know, what, what goes into making sure that no matter how much you stylize in the future, there are still rules that you hold back. 
So how is it cheating if it's sciences? Would it be cheating if a um, NASA engineer were to use a ruler? No, because there are sciences at hand, sciences that they have to maintain. Um, so I want to make a case for this whenever I can, and this is what we're talking about here. Um, there, are, there are sciences that require measurement, and it's not optional whether or not you maintain those measurements if you're trying to maintain likeness, which is skill, which is admiration, which is success in life, which is paying your bills. Um, where you are allowed to stylize, which is what he's done, is where you are allowed to be artistic, where you are allowed to do whatever you want. That's where your inner person comes out. So it's a, it's a matter of sacrifice and maturity, being able to sacrifice your so-called in artist, in canvas identity um, for the sciences, because you'll realize the sooner you surrender to the sciences, the sooner your work will look like how you imagine it to look and how uh, the sooner the respect you'll attain and the notoriety you'll attain because of your ability to see what others can. And trust me, there is a lot of anatomy you're not seeing and you don't know that you're not seeing it. Um, so that really, really needs to come, you know, it needs to happen right away. A lot of the people that report success after excessive measurements like this, they won't need any more measurement later. And you know where they'll be left off? They'll be left off with amazing eyeballing skills later, that much better than you uh, as if it's, uh, well, while you were studying and assuming that it was cheating. So they'll be way past you. They'll have, you know, forfeited and submitted that pride factor that keeps them, that kept you from measuring and they'll be much better than you. And that pisses me off because I don't want anyone better than me. So what I do is I make sure that I'm measuring whenever I can. That should be how you guys are. It's a certain competitiveness that you guys need to need to get into. And the sooner you delay, the, 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 you know, the, later, sorry, the, the later it happens, the more you delay your measurement in the sciences, the less you'll improve and the sooner others will supersede you. Um, so that, that should be an encouraging factor for you. Um, to answer that question. Uh, Sofa Strangler says, even, can I just call you Christopher? <laughs> even uh, Renaissance painters trace figures using a camera obscura like devices exactly. Um, I'm not sure who who it was. I think that was, uh, he's, he's completely slipped my mind his name, but um, he uses a special camera to help him identify values. So it's like a grayscale camera. Um, and he's really, really famous for his accurate lighting. It's just scientifically accurate, and everyone wonders how until it was discovered he was using a camera the whole time. It's not a camera, it's not taking photographs, but it was something he looked through that was right beside his canvas. Ah, um, oh, I forgot his name. Um, I think I'd feel better using more minimal trend lines if possible. Don't minimize, don't respond to that inner fear of that fact that you might be tracing. You're just going to delay your improvement that much more. You're missing out on some major nuances in the eye, um, in the eye tilt, in, in, in the location and attitude of the lower eyelid that changes the way a personality works, that, that governs the expression. You only have so much expression that you can attain through an eye that you can only understand and analyze um, through measurement, so I do encourage you not to mute your, your, your inner science scientist at all. I know there's a massive call to be creative, but it's there's no place for that in the sandbox, grayscale environment that you're part of right now that you're paying for. So you have to be able to put that aside, save it for another session, save it for fun time, sketchbook, um, and that way you're not worrying about measurement or anything like that where you're just working for. Uh, creative sake but right now what you're trying to do is get all of the heavy miles behind you the harder miles the real trek the upward climb all those high altitude miles that you got to get out of the way and this means these heavy duty pieces here the more of these you do the more potential to fail the more potential to improve all right so let's get into that um, so to introduce everyone that's here today even if they're not responding we have Abu Anton RJ Christopher Dan uh, Johnny Julia Kira and Tatian uh, welcome everyone. There's a lot of our, our patrons who aren't here today, but the recording will be up there for them. Okay, um, so what I see here is just a little bit of a of a mis misinterpretation of the com composition. So if we were to analyze this value on her nose and compare it to the value on her mouth, so this is a big one. This is one of those things that you don't discover until later or until someone points it out. Take a look at where this highlighter value is and take a look at where the mouth is. It looked like it was the same value, didn't it? It pisses me off. <laughs> um, and when I discovered this, I realized why I was throwing off the composition so many times. 
Just because a value is surrounded by other darker values does not mean it is comparable or is reflective or is high in uh, uh, an altitude as the rest of these of, of, of the you know of the of the face. We have a specific pattern that we have to follow, constrictions that we have to follow. So just because it looks lighter down here does not mean we lighten it in that way. And that's something that you did, Dan. Um, just along here, this entire flat plane is the brightest point. Anything similar to it right up here would be the next flat plane. So this plane, if there was a, a vector coming out of it, if you guys remember one of my videos, I explained that lighting typically is, imagine a straight line coming out of every single polygon. Um, so imagine a cube, and a straight line is coming out, the most average straight line. If it's a crazy shape, just find the most average of each region, which is why we block. To block is to create restrictions, identify an average. So write that down, write that in your notes. To block is to identify an average, a local average. A local average means that, let's say this, this is a really complicated rock, but we broke it into a million little uh, local averages. A local average is one block, one surface area. Because we've identified it as one consistent average, it has to be straight all the way around. It cannot be multiple values that are considered an average. No, one block is one average. It could go over many tiny little bumps, but that's the average of each bump depending on the external angle um, of displacement. All sounds like crazy science, as I promise it's really not. It's very simple. Uh, but imagine the sunlight is here. Forget about all this. Imagine the sunlight is here coming down. The angle of displacement it just means that this is no longer facing in the same angle as this. Uh, so we have, um, sorry, let me just keep this open. Uh, what we have is uh, this angle here responding to this light source as more exposed. This one is even more displaced from the light source. So this has its own average, even though this low poly once looked like uh, image mode RGB. Even though this low poly once looked like this, right? What we're doing is finding local averages by blocking. So this is one average, and this is why we have a projected poly under all of these pieces. Uh, so where is it? Um, the submission, where did it go? Um, there we go. Yep, so this is what we mean when we're blocking in. We're finding the local averages. So even though you did block in, this value still feels a little bit light. Uh, still feels like it's um, a little bit strong um, just around here and what we want to see is even more of a of a difference between this value and this value right here which is not as big as a jump as where it was before between here and somewhere here and that's because there is one larger common denominator shape which has even more general local values so you would say okay this is one plane and this is one plane where there's an even more simple polygon of the face that has even less local averages, more like general averages, and that would be the one big beard shadow. So we could say the face looks a little bit like, like that, and that would be where the nose is, that would be where the eyes are. This is a very general shape for the um, face area. We can add a little bit more polys here for the head, just something like that. Temples, maybe they'll crush in this way a symmetry line, and then this would be the beard shadow. So this is one massive local average. If you don't have this system in your brain right now, you are going to consistently have value fidelity issues. You're going to consistently uh, be uh, value sharing. And value sharing is just the, the, the number one way to ruin your painting. You could have a wonderful understanding of anatomy, but it, in order to marry that anatomy with form knowledge is how you'll ever be able to draw without reference. And if you don't know how to execute these rules of basic form and space and understanding the law of averages and, and spaces on a surface area with minimal cubes, uh, minimal polygons from a light source that's universal, you won't be able to, no matter how well you remember the eye, be able to figure out how it sits in space. Um, so that's the general or the more specific science, but the fix would just be to just darken that area. But I want to make sure that that theory is out there. So what we I typically do something called a beard shadow, which is what I call it in uh, critique hour. So does everyone have any questions about this uh, system? Does it seem a little bit too sciencey for you? Uh, it will, it will seem, you know, without, without doubt, it will seem a bit too sciencey for you, but um, I, I definitely think that you're only going to ever benefit from it. 
Then I'm going to talk really quickly about how to smudge. So you can't talk about blocking. The theme of this month is blocking and edge work. Edge work meaning all the polygon laws. Um, and all <laughs> uh, Whoa, this is too sciencey. Uh, it's okay. Um, all the polygon laws and all of that. Um, you can't talk about that without talking about smudging. So I'm going to be talking about that and how to balance your smudging um, because when you create edge work, you're always working with harsh edges first. That's what you're doing first, the blocks, the, the general description of each local average represented with a hard cut, solid polygon. Um, we can't do that. We can't do that when we added a portrait. Now it's become a thing. Now it's subjective. It's no longer just a single object. And because we did that, we have to remember that hard edges are only used for focal points. That's another thing you write down. Um, when we're talking about smudging, we have to smudge not only to represent a change in contour in the portrait, uh, so that means that fatty pockets like this have to have different kind of gradient and a different level of smudging than, let's say, the nose wherein we keep and preserve a lot of the blocks. Um, so this definitely needs to be smudged even more, not just considering blocks, but an extra little layer we've added, like imagining getting a little layer, an extra little layer of information we're folding back on top. And this question, this, for, this extra little layer is a question of what is the focal point, which is a question you ask in the entirety, throughout the entirety of the painting. You may ask the blocking question in the first 30 to 40 minutes, and that's how you get the ball rolling. But when you're painting from the first brush stroke to the very last one, you are constantly asking what is the focal point. Because as long as you're still applying paint, you're threatening the focal point. If you're threatening the focal point, you have to constantly have that question live. Um, so in order to address that constantly, we think about the focal point as a radius. This would be 100% radius. I'm going to repeat this every single time. A lot of students don't understand this. A lot of these will be repeated uh, thumb, uh, fundamentals. But this is 100% radius around the eye. And what we have is anything outside of this radius is, is decreased by a fraction. So before I talk about the fractions, which I'm going to leave a little thing right here, I'm going to answer some questions. Um, uh, I understand it in my mind, but being, being able to do it, though. Um, if you understand, whenever you, talk, whenever you say something like, okay, I understand it only in my mind, that should be a big giveaway that, no, you don't. If you only understand something in your mind and you say you understand it, and you're, you're only understanding it verbally. I mean, you're just understanding my English. Um, to understand something is to be able to recreate it because you've understood its mechanics. Therefore, you should be able to recreate the mechanics if, if, if requested. You should be able to teach the mechanics if one, someone asked you. So if someone asked you, Kira, uh, what exactly does it mean by local average per value? What does that mean? Why should we be blocking? Why should we do that? You should be able to instruct them and give, it, give a detailed explanation of what the benefits are. That's only when you've really understood it. And your explanation and your diagram should be high skill level. You should be, you should be at a point where you've benefited from this. So if you're only understanding me because, well, I'm speaking English, that's not you actually understanding it. There is a mileage in, in, invested in actually saying, I understand it. So remember that. If, if at any point in time you find yourself, hey, I think I understand this. I just can't put it to paper. You don't understand it yet. And that just means that much more time you're paying towards uh, uh, that, 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 that study. The problem here is that a student will think they are past this lesson. They think, oh yeah, I've heard the blocking. I've heard the blocking lecture. I'm gonna move on to something more advanced, more detailed. Uh, no, you're not ready for that. Some people just think they understand something and they trick themselves into thinking they're advancing. Um, to understand something, especially one of the big concrete pillar fundamentals like blocking or that how to, how, to, how how to lighting period like where where is my light source that's a pillar that's a that's as much a pillar as physics is a pillar to sciences uh, to art where is my light source that's the number one question um, so uh, if if you find yourself not being able to apply where is my light source on your canvas then you don't understand it yet okay so just think about that um, I'm afraid that my skin looks too plastic like and my smudging has some texture but overall it feels really smooth. Uh, I'm gonna talk about smudging in a second. I'm gonna move into, um, uh, I'm not sure what I just wrote here. 
<laughs> this is my life. Uh, fractions? What, what the heck did I just write here? Somebody help, help me. Fraction. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. <clears throat> with books, I often have to read uh, it several times to pick up on things or be able to really understand what it is, what is it, what it is saying, as I need more practice and knowledge to really get it. Uh, same with Control Paint's free video library. Uh, from my current experience, it's hard to admit, but I've understood that I need to slow down and absorb the lesson knowledge. Maybe others here have the same problem. In a rush to improve what we, and insist we get what to do, but we really don't. Exactly. Yeah, a lot of students have um, issues just thinking they understand it. They, they're really not there yet. Um, how there's 100% hard edge focal point around the eyes, I think is what you mean by fraction. Oh, right. <laughs> thank you, Dan. <laughs> Teacher's assistant, thank you so much. Um, so, yes, the fraction, it, it, it's what you do when you shave off the opacity. Let's say you use 100% opacity for your blocking brush and detailing around the eye. You cut that by a fraction and you decide around the edge of the canvas, I'm going to be at 30% of that color I use around the face. This is exactly the same thing goes for uh, brush size. So if your brush size went down to, let's say, 30, uh, let's say 15, let's say 15 around the eyes, what happens is that it will go down into... Um, let me make sure I'm still recording. Yep. Uh, it'll go down into, it'll enlarge by a certain fraction when you're out here. So let's say, okay, out here I'm only going to use, let me see, 100. 100 size, not 100%, just 100 size. So between here and here, you're going to have to learn how to fraction, how you jump from 15 to 100. So you restrict yourself. Um, let's say over here, I'm only, I'm going to be at 50. Uh, 50 size, which is actually pretty good for lips. And this is a soft brush, so ew. So this would be 50 size. This would be 50. This is a whole new brush, but it's okay. I'll just keep these sizes. And then this would be 100. This is how I manage not to throw off my focal point. Out here, I'm only going to use large brushes. In here, I'm only going to use this size brush around the lips, around the mouth, and up anywhere between here and here, between 15 and 50, I'm going to use 40, 30, uh, sorry, 30, uh, 20, and then down to 15. Okay, so you at no point in your entire life should, should you be using 15 size brush down here because you've established this as the marker, as the anchor, as the landmark, as the measurement tool, as like the foot or the pound or the currency of what your focal point is worth in your painting. This is the capacity for detail if for some reason, somehow, despite the fact that you're in periphery vision, you see one thing in detail, it, it, that, that's not possible. It, somehow you develop a third eye and suddenly you can see detail on the outside of your two eyes. Let me elaborate. When we're looking at a canvas, what we're trying to do is paint as if the person is seeing with the naked eye. We're not trying to paint it the way we see it in a reference. So this takes me to my smudging uh, discussion. So when we're looking at this girl, we have never in our entire lives seen this much detail when we looked at a person. We see one thing at a time, always. Uh, so if we're looking at her eyes, don't move from her eyes, you guys. Stay right here. Um, don't move from the brush. Stay right here. Don't move. But now pay attention. I'm going to move my brush. Don't move your eyes with my brush. Stay at the eyes. But using your periphery vision, observe where I'm pointing at. Does that not look like a 100 size brush amount to you? How about her hairline? Don't look at the brush. Don't look at the hairline. Look only at the eyes, but try to focus on this part of your periphery. Look at how smudgy that is. That is what your brush should be doing. So your paint, your painting should be a direct reflection of the limitations of periphery vision and just naked eye vision, just, just being, seeing things with, your, with the naked eye. You never want to detail as much as a photograph details because a camera sees everything at the same time. A camera does not see um, the way an eye does, unless you program it to and you, you record it to like, you know, smudge or, or, or blur uh, around the edges or something silly or some really messed up looking cheesy like filter. Um, but there's no way to really properly reflect or represent what happens in your periphery vision. Um, also notice you don't see colors that well in your periphery vision. 
Uh, so there are these tests that people have. They, they, they have the little piece of paper that's colored, kind of just enter their line of sight on the sides of their eyes while they're looking forward. Someone probably will have a very hard time telling the difference between red or green. And again, that's because there's not enough light to feed the eye the info from the, from the little card, or um, it's just the eye focus isn't there, uh, the way the light bends in your eye. There's so many reasons behind it. And that's exactly the same reason why we decrease saturation on the edges of the canvas. And we increase saturation, increase contrast, which is the amount of light feeding the information to the eye, and shrink the brush and maximize edge, um, just pure edge lasso, unforgiving edge work around the focal point because that's where we want the viewer of our painting to be looking. So that extra layer of where is my focal point, that question, um, that's, what, that's what helps guide us around what we are blending. Okay, so let's talk about that really quickly. Um, so let's uh, find this. So I'm going to choose one to instruct through. Is this Dan's? Yes. So I'm going to use one to instruct through and then the rest will be critiqued. If you can't get into the uh, hangout, it's okay. Um, try to keep trying. <laughs> uh, you should be able to, I think we can have like 15 now. I'm not sure how to get 15 people in. Um, but if you can't get in, I promise there's going to be a recording and uh, and we can do it th then. But if it, uh, at any point comes to the, to the fact that we have to go on uh, Hangouts, I mean we have to leave Hangouts and go on private stream, then I'm just going to private stream from now. Okay, so if you can't get in, it's okay. There is a recording upcoming. All right, so let's get into smudging. I'm not sure how many of you have smudging brushes. Um, I believe I've already given out a bunch of them for the previous months for Patreon. Uh, I will be handing out, I think I gave one last month for the smudging, uh, the select brushes for February. I'm not sure if you guys have this, but some of my favorite smudging brushes from my set are, I'll take questions in a little bit, promise. If your questions haven't been answered, just repeat them at the end of the class. So one of my smudging brushes, the number five smudging brush is this really, really strong one. This is at 17% only. At 100%, it's just madness. Um, but it's really, really helpful. Uh, what's something that I've been doing that really reflects periphery vision for me is going on like 5% smudge and just looking at what it does to the detail. It leaves behind a beautiful texture, but it minimizes and kind of undermines the amount of detail you have. And whenever I'm smudging, I think about, of course, the focal point reason to smudge, but also texture. So write that down. Texture, smudging along texture, is smudging in a, in a strategic way where we are still seeing the nature of the texture. So if we look at her hairline, we can't very well draw every single one if we just set up a rule on where is my light source and where is my focal point and where am I going to access all the contrast and detail. We can't just go in there and draw every single little hair, and if we do, it has to be so excessively blurred that it's not even there anymore. Um, and if for some reason we're aiming at high realism, it has to be so much more, so much less detailed than the eyes, and that's a whole other story. And I'll talk, I'll talk one day about how I managed to paint every single little strand of hair but keep it general, which is something I've been doing in my paintings. But for now, what you want to do is stay away from hair detailing, just making sure you're painting in blocks, large to small. Remember that hair is um, blocked together and stuck together with oils and all other kinds of um, products and stuff like that. Um, sometimes the, 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 the way the hair is styled, the way the hair just naturally clumps together, some hairs, depending on, you know, inch by inch, changes direction and hair growth. So. Some section in your temple travels one way, and as you can see, that means that we brush down and follow the hairbrush pattern. So once we have all that in place, hair as a texture is, when we're looking at the eyes, to do, do that periphery test. Test yourself, teach yourself how to try the periphery test. Look only at the eyes in your, in your reference. This is about your reference, you guys, not about your painting. Um, it goes back, of course, into your painting, but we're talking about how to observe our reference and know what detail to bring back and what to smudge. Um, so make sure your eyes are static on the focal point and then you're only observing without moving your eyes your periphery. And in the periphery, this looks like a big bunch of mush. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing. All right? Another area that is non-texture that goes back into focal point is the edge of the face. 
So I've darkened around here. I think, no, this was the other painting. So I'm just going to darken along that beard shadow, that local value I was talking about. So I'm just darkening one large section. I'm also going to radially step away from that value because, as you can see over here, the face kind of descends into the shadows. See how this is so much darker than this, and this is darker than this, and this is darker than this? That's a radial shade uh, uh, drop. So what we're doing is shrinking our brush. So that's what we got to do first. <clears throat> and as you can see, I'm using a soft brush, and this soft brush is a bit of a, it causes trouble for some students. A lot of students have um, issues knowing when to use the soft brush. Just remember, give your edges a chance first. Do your polygon. Most of the time, you don't need a soft brush. But if you're at a point where you are starting to see intricacies like the blur and the smudge and the radial shades on the outsides. Soft brush, honestly, is the best brush you can use for those situations. But be very careful not to use it anywhere else. So 5%, and I'm just throwing it on the edge of the face. What this is going to do is reinforce the focal point, really make it feel like she's involved in her surrounding. She's slowly emerging out of the shadow, which is exactly what we have here. Same thing with the ears. Ears are very, very blurred. Do not over-render ears. They are at the level of the eyebrows and nose and the eye. They are very, very quick interrupters to the focal point. And they don't count because they're on the flat side of the head on the other side. Another big thing you missed is, is the edges of the mouth. I'm using another uh, kind of representation of the texture here. So the texture here in this case, which is another reason to smudge, and that's why I never forgive um, and like, a, like a, a student who's trying to figure all this out who doesn't have a smudge brush in their kit. Like a, I even have one that I'm just giving out to students as I teach them that's outside of my brush set. Um, just anything to give them a scatter, anything to give them that effect because there's just so much that calls for it. And the fact that skin is a texture, so write that down, skin is a texture, is another reason why we smudge. And remember that skin is what dresses up all these heavy polygons. So nothing stays as an unforgiving shadow or unforgiving edge anymore. And shadows are no longer completely black. Sometimes that, because it's no longer flat clay polygon sculpture, it's no longer blocking anymore, it turns into skin, it becomes translucent. So remember that skin is a texture and it changes the way our brush works. So what are the three, can anyone answer what are the three reasons we smudge today? <clears throat> All right, so I'm just going to wait. So I'm smudging around the mouth. As you can see, the smudging I'm doing is with a 5%. And an under-rendered under lip is a well-rendered lip. Under-rendered, not unrendered. So be very careful with your texture from here on out, Dan. I'm just doing a smaller brush around the chin, larger brush for the cheeks and the face, smaller brush around the chin. And as you can see, it's really giving us that wonderful effect of feeling like the face really is kind of pulling away into the shadow. An under-rendered lip um, is a well-rendered lip. Not unrendered, under-rendered, that's the key term, under-rendered. It's still rendered, but under-rendered significantly compared to the, uh, to the face. Bye, Christopher, thanks for joining. Um, I'm not sure if you submitted anything for today, but we will be looking at your stuff if you did, so you can just catch it in the recording. For anyone who wants to come in, I believe uh, Christopher's position um, is now freed if you guys want to try the hangout. <clears throat> you didn't? Oh, okay. All right. Focal point texture. Mm-hmm. Preserve focal point, determine local average. Yeah, so hair texture and periphery texture, so anything that you can pull off in periphery um, as a texture with your smudging brush. Smudging along focal points, um, again, just a reflection of the periphery uh, question. And then texture, skin as a texture, or hair as a texture. Being able to remember that the smudge brush is like using a blocking brush for rocks. Smudge brush is the brush to go to to, to imitate the feeling of uh, skin. 
Um, which is why I say you really don't need to use soft brush that much because 1% on smudge tool gave us everything we needed to see around here. So let's just have a look. Just with these changes, let's just have a look and see what has happened to this painting. Okay, after. Can you see that? And that's what I feel like you were missing. So students can be overly technical. Students can be uh, pretty dedicated to the fundamentals once they find them out. And um, <laughs> that's cute. I love it. Uh, but there needs to be a certain graceful step backward uh, when us assessing why is it, what is it that we're taking back from a, re from a reference? What is it that we're taking back from a photograph? Uh, what is this, how much of the information do we keep? We keep all of it. All of it is still there. I mean, we measured everything, didn't we? So we keep all measurements. And make sure you guys are writing this down. The stuff that we take from references is all the measurements. Every last measurement we take it. Some are exaggerated when it comes to caricature. And I think a lot of us have a certain level of caricature in our work. Um, another thing that we take back is the likeness. So measurement in likeness, that's trend lines. Uh, so likeness, exaggeration, uh, character, expression, all of that characterization stuff. Um, that's what we take back. We do not take back the detail. We do not take back all the detail. Um, so remember that there is an amount that you keep, an amount that you don't, and the amount that you don't is the stuff that we would never have seen if our eyes were static on one thing um, in our nude vision. Just in our naked vision, we're not seeing uh, certain details. That's what we don't take back with us, which is hard to do because people like to shift their eyes around while they draw. Students tend to focus on one piece for some reason of, of hair clump and forget about the eyes completely. Uh, but remember, when you're meeting someone, where do you look? When you want your viewers to meet your character, where do you want them to look? What would you like to tell? What is the story you're trying to tell? That's what you make their, exactly, their eyes. Um, sometimes you're meeting someone and you're looking at their lips. It depends on how you're representing them. So this one painting that I painted, um, the girl was tilted down. Uh, so let me find it for you. Let me just... Uh, where are you? There we go. So the girl was tilted down, and I had to have, I know that the eyes are much more detailed than the mouth, and I stylized quite a bit. I kept my detail scope pretty much intact, but there are some issues here and there. Uh, but I had to detail this part, and as much as I didn't want to, as much as, you know, my, you know I'm teaching under rendered lip, it's a well-rendered lip, I had to detail this part because part of the characterization was this uh, indirect outline of the upper lip and this very, very, uh, and this is what I mean by characterizing, characterization, this very specifically kind of M-shaped Cupid's bow in her mouth that kind of made her mouth what it is. It's just, it's just who, what her mouth is. Sometimes you have triangular Cupid's bow, sometimes you don't have a Cupid's bow, but hers um, was specifically kind of like a, M shaped, like a McDonald's M, and I really wanted to exaggerate that. So when the character is tilted away from you, there's some information you have to keep back because if I met her, I'd have been like, wow, what an unusual Cupid's bow. So I would have been looking at that, and that's what I want the viewer to look at. So this is actually pretty high contrast for just the lip area, if you've noticed, but for some reason it works. It's an old painting, but it's definitely one of the moments where I, I was so confused about how to keep it, and I said, as long as I'm looking at it, as long as for some reason my eyes are going there and I find it intriguing, so will my viewer. So I'm going to share just a little bit of the focal point down from the nose to the cupid's bow. But I'm going to stop at the cupid's bow because that's all I was looking at. I wasn't looking at the lower lip. I wasn't looking at the chin. If I start bringing in contrast to the chin and the lower lip, that's when I'm just going to throw off the portrait completely. How much of this portrait you painted was reference and how much, it, how much of it was intuitive? Um, the nose was referenced, the eyes were intuitive pretty much because of the way that they had uh, tilted away from the, from the camera in the wrong way. Um, it was a combination of two different re references and one dominant reference. Um, uh, so, any more questions? Let me see. Preserve focal point, determine local average. Um, okay, so I'm going to continue just talking about the smudging and the edge work, seeing how many of you have preserved your edge work. 
Um, so as you can see, just by focusing on edge work for a little while, we are opening a window and a door to a whole other fundamental uh, discussion, and that is smudging. So it, it, it's all hand in hand. It's like one door leading into another. Understanding one fundamental leads you into another. But when I say understanding, I really mean it. You guys have to be able to thoroughly understand these mechanics and thoroughly understand the layers of questioning on, on, around your workflow. Sometimes I use 100% opacity around the eyes, but in a small brush. Is that okay? Absolutely. Uh, the eyes go crazy. Uh, just if you have eyebrow detail, like at least five brush strokes of thin brush around eyebrows, you have to have lashes. If you have, if you have to have lashes, you don't have to have eyebrows. But if you have to have eyebrows, uh, eyebrow hair, uh, as in like little brush strokes, you have to have lashes. That's because one is closer to what we're looking at when we meet someone than the other. So eyebrow, <laughs> when we meet someone, when was the last time you looked at someone's eyebrows while you met them? You think you were weird. Um, so what we do is we look at the pupils and we look at the iris when we meet someone. We go back and forth between each one. We don't really meet someone's eyebrows and look at those only and then sometimes we'll look at the eyes. So if you have lashes, this is optional. But if you have these, you also have to have this. Because if you can see these, you can see these. All right? Any more questions? I, the more detailed, the better. These are the questions you're getting out of the way now. These are the questions you're taking back with you. And I'm going to do one little discussion about blocking here, and then we'll do another before and after. Um, your, your, uh, I'll talk about the pupils as well. The pupils are a little bit off, um, so I'm not sure if it was the way you interpreted what was happening here. But always make sure that the pupils are perfectly centered, and it's the iris that is crossed. The pupil is, write that down, the pupil is centered, the iris is crossed. The iris is the big circle, the pupil is the smaller circle. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I worry that I over-render or make my portrait too photo-like if you answered how to tackle that. The pupil is centered, the iris is centered. Exactly. Um, so, overly detailed, it's always, it always goes back to the pupils. What are you doing around the pupils? How sharp is the water line? Um, anything around the pupils, that's the max level you're ever going to do. If anything is close to that, then you're overdoing it. Then it feels busy. That's really what feels busy means. Uh, when a painting feels busy, it just doesn't have a focused focal point. It doesn't have a dedicated focal point. <clears throat> um, so these questions I'm going to answer later, Anton, because they're a bit general. Um, I'm just taking questions on the current topic, but I will try to answer your question. Uh, make sure that you ask it later. All right. Uh, so some things that I want to remind you, stuff that you should have kept back from your from your blocking. So right here, this value goes up too high. This is one of the blocks that was that came from our local values. However, because you have an edge, it does not mean that you can't slide this value back up. You don't have to have a solid drop, just a cliff drop between the eyebrows. Um, you can definitely have a more Trend, like a, a better transition, but the transition has to be respectful of the local value, which is that uh, that we were talking about the, the blocks and all of those surface areas and all that business, all that sciencey stuff. All right, so some more smudging that has to do with texture um, is smudging around the start of every eyebrow. And this is only if you're not going to be detailing the eyebrow later. And even if, if you are, you have a good bed here. Another smudge brush that I use that I've also given, I believe, in the February kit is uh, the number four, which is my favorite one. And uh, as a paintbrush, it looks a bit like this. It's very, very strong, but it has um, this sporadic kind of distribution. Sometimes you have a couple brushes like this one and this one just out of the way and that's what makes it so spreadable. So I'm just smudging away. All right, that you can get away with and you see how much less masculine it looks when we do that because we're trying to get all of that out of the way. So any negative space, any breathing room, anywhere where we just never find ourselves looking unless there's like a big old pimple like right over here, we never really find ourselves noticing this area. Um, and that's the area that we smudge. So just like that artist that I just showed you, um, 
He smudged right in between these two. When was the last time we looked at this area? Which is why he felt like he could forfeit this little edge. Even though if a lip did that, it would be like a lip melted together. But for some reason, he felt like we're not looking there. And just take a look at what he did here. Exactly the same thing. Just smudging just in between the eyebrows. Um, so these are solid rules even the professionals use. And I just want to show you some more of his work. He's just amazing. You should really be aiming for artists just like this. He does this a lot. Very, very little detailed description on spaces that are negative, non-existent spaces that we very spend very, very little time on. He's amazing, right? And this is stuff he's doing. So just around here, I'm going to smudge around the lips. And what happens when you smudge... Um, in a piece that started off, can anyone guess, in a piece that started off high edge work. So we, again, give ourselves more edges than we need so that when we smudge, what's left behind is what? I can give you guys the link um, to this. You have the edges that you need, exactly. And what happens to those edges when they're beside all this smudging, all this, uh, let me correct, strategic smudging? So for the upcoming homework for March, I want to see this kind of smudging. And I'm going to be giving out this brush again, these brushes that I've used, the brush that I'll, that I'll be using in the instructional video. Um, uh, so make sure that you guys are taking advantage of those brushes. Make sure your strength is nice and low. They look even harder because of the smudges around them. They become detail and focal points. Exactly. So you don't have to do any more work once your blocks are done. You're done rendering. What you have to do, what I've been doing to Dan's poor piece, is just under-rendering. But for some reason, it looks more complete. Why? There's less edges. That's because we've refocused and recreated an atmosphere of detail, a weakness to the eye. We've created weakness in periphery vision that accentuates the strength in certain areas of the vision where we have focus. And the piece looks more complete because the focal points and the edges we provided earlier are now exaggerated, are now stronger. Okay, there's one more reason why we smudge, and that's a, a texture, but like environmental, kind of like wetness or, or hydration. And what I do sometimes on 1%, I just smudge over the eye. An eye that is super detailed looks very, I don't know, satanic. <laughs> it doesn't look right. Um, so I smudge around the pupils on purpose so that they look less plastered, they look less like contacts, and they look more wet. Um, so we want that. Okay. Over rendering, doing more work doesn't make the painting better. Under rendering, smudge your um, unimportant areas, edges, exactly. Um, same, not weak, but kind of just had a breakthrough. <clears throat> this really helps a ton. It answered this question I was struggling with for like weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, repeat the question, maybe other people have had it too. All right, and then another thing that you kind of missed, Dan, is the uh, shadow of the upper eyelid, this lash line, really, really thick umbrella put there by nature to give us some shade. Well, that shade needs to be represented because that's anatomically, that's the function of the eye. And for those who are still having issues with eyes, please, please, please watch my latest video. I spend a lot of time describing it. It's definitely something to keep in mind between now and our next critique hour. You might, I'm sure you do, have a lot of the issues I describe in there. There's a lot of forgotten lessons that have to do with eyes. Please make sure you watch the latest video. Because I smudged, I kind of lost some of the, uh, some of this over here. So I'm just going to re enforce some of the whiteness in the eye. Remember that you can't go as white as, a, as the reference, uh, but even the white of the reference is actually pretty dark because, again, it's about relative value. Relative value is that thing I showed you with the edge of the mouth. We don't even need what she had on the edge of the mouth. Her lip is very, very under-rendered. I'll, I'll fix that, uh, but um, it still feels light compared to its area, but this is dark. Look at that compare it to this, all right? So local values, keep them in mind. They continue on, they're very, very important. <clears throat> the question that Dan was discussing was mainly if I was rendering too close to the photo. 
and not doing anything artistic or creative in my rendition of the reference. You can be as artistic and creative as you want with your brushes, how much you retain, but there's some stuff that has to be kept intact. And you have a lot of fun with how you want to interpret with your brush what's happening to the hair. You just have to make sure it's under rendered. Uh, so yeah, really good question. And now I know how to carry and imbue something artistic into my rendition through smudging and selective detailing. Yep, selective detailing governed by, of course, uh, the focal point and the periphery vision and all of that stuff. <clears throat> okay, so once we've created a nice bed of under-rendered lip here, just this whole structure, what I'm going to do is just grab the dark value and kind of just throw it in there as messily as I can and then grab the not the brightest one because that's going to give me too much info for something as low as this especially because it's tilted away from them. I'm just going to grab something nearby and use that as the little brush stroke I have here and here. And that's about as much as you need. Remember how that artist smudged out the lip area? This shadow is a little too strong for an upper, uh, for a lower lip looking up at the light. So I'm going to clean that up. The upper lip actually has a lot of bounce light on it, so I'm going to throw a, bit, a quick brush there. I can't block because this is so late in the game, uh, but I can just use like a 68% kind of just render as I block kind of deal, which is something I do a lot when I critique. Um, so I, sometimes I want to show how important it is to keep your brush strong, uh, but I'm critiquing on a paint on a finished painting or, uh, as is, so I have to kind of go in between. But if this is you early on in your painting, you're not critiquing, go 100%. Give yourself more detail than you need. Then I'm going to do a quick little line here, a quick line here, and then what do I do after? Do I keep it like this? <clears throat> How late in the game can I still block on a painting? Um, so I discussed earlier that 30 to 40 minutes should be you just asking the question of the block. After you're done that, you start blending, which is what we discussed all this session. Um, and how to blend um, and uh, I've discussed that in the video for this month if you guys have watched that I talk about fat pockets and bone areas and and dome patterns and how to smudge around that um, and this is just an extension of this video uh, so you can block if for some reason you have to redo the whole nose but you really shouldn't be needing to block with a hundred percent that's like three hours into the painting so anyone have a have a suggestion on what to do <clears throat> uh, after this? Do I keep it like this? Any suggestions? Should smudge out the lips? Okay, good. And I'm just smudging away. Another thing that a soft brush is really good for, it's the same thing, but another location of uh, th uh, radial shading is the... Uh, the corners of the lips are kind of infamous, infamous for the fact that they need all this radial shading, grooming. So we have darkened layer, we have our dark value, and then we've got our radial drop just around the corners of the lips. So the lips really feel like they're bending away. And if I feel like compared to the eyes, her lips are pretty, um, uh, pretty. They're very signature lips, so what I need to do is bring in more detail. And this is another one of those instances, but this is detail. Nowhere close to this. Look at how big this brush seems to the eyes. Look at that, right? That's huge. But look at how perfect the size it is for the lips. All right, this is how you maintain your brush radial uh, control, making sure that it's, it's, it's enlarged and never small enough to, to complete what's happening in the eyes. Fixing the value, kind of overdid it while I was striking. Throwing a nice big brush stroke right across the top. And then the last little thing I need is just a bit of an edge just around here. But this is not unrendered, this is under rendered, okay? And again, just smudging. Preserving that because that's behaving as a cast shadow. No, never, never zoom in too much. That was a mistake. 
And then finally, the last little bit of detail is the way the lip folds on top of this little sole patch thing. And this is an area where I might need an edge. So see that area that I just added? That's all we need to detail the lips. The last little specular jump forward for the wetness of the lip. Uh, sometimes I like to over-render this area. I mean over-smudge this area right here and here. Um, but other than that, pretty much you're pretty much done okay she does have a bit of a like a little pattern of shadow going down like this something like this this could have been something you blocked in early on we can actually keep this if we smudge it out and that's just to do with likeness that that speci specificity isn't important for the an anatomy because it's not every lip has this but the fact that we have an upper and lower lip and we have the radial shade, that is specific to anatomy. Okay. All right, uh, smudge, should smudge out the lips. Did I over render the uh, filter on Cupid's bow? Um, not really, no, it doesn't feel over rendered. There are some issues with the nose though. So you have this little bit of shadow here that I'm not sure where it is coming from. There's, there's, no, there's nothing here that counters or contests the amount of darkness you need or shares in that value around the nose. So, because there's so little respect, for lack of a better word really, paid to the edges around your nostrils, I really recommend for you specifically, Dan, some nose studies. Just so you can perfect your edge on edge uh, values, you're making sure that you have all of your types of edges intact. I talk again, I talk about what edges are in that video from Critique Hour. Please watch it if you haven't watched it and then rewatch this recording if you need to so you can maximize how much information you're retaining. But that edge needed to be sharp. She, if anything, she has a little patch of light that's right there because of the bounce light. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at the before, after. Look at that focal point, doesn't it just like scream for your attention? And imagine having a bit more edge work around the eyes, some minor detail around the eyebrows. Uh, see how we can still texture on a bed of smudging? And just like that. Okay, so do we have any questions? <laughs> for spec. <laughs> Um, I think I forgot to smudge that out, but I'll make, make it a harder edge. I'll definitely will do more nose studies. Um, it never needed to be smudged. It never needed to be there to be smudged out, is what I mean. That, that was just a floating, floating value. Um, it was never uh, required there. Okay, um, so I hope this was helpful for you guys. I'm going to go into everyone else's critiques and then talk about people's select pieces outside of the challenges. I'm just going to have a quick uh, drink of water. Okay, so this piece is by Link, um, and we're just going to talk about, <clears throat> so this is something continuous with Link, actually. Uh, he's one of my private students, and I've seen this in his other work. Uh, for some reason, the edges feel very, very kind of out of control, but if I could just show you his day one work, he's improved so much, it's ridiculous. I started with him only a couple months ago, and now he's painting stuff like this, and I just take every opportunity to kind of show him off. Okay, so I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why it happens. I'd love to watch your workflow. I'd love to watch and assess why you make the choice not to clean up the edges, but you do. You leave them messy. Please clean them up. Um, it's The edge is just one of the big edges, so who here knows the different types of edges? <laughs> Who here knows the two major types of edges? Hard and soft edges. No. No. There's only one kind of edge and it's hard. <laughs> Plane change or overlap, exactly. Yeah, stacking, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plane change or overlap. 
Uh, so plain change is when you have a piece of paper, imagine a piece of paper, and it folds. This value will not have the same edge as this value, and because uh, value as this value, um, and this edge is a 40, completely like 90 degree angle, or it doesn't matter if it's a cube of two, it's just an angle with a with a with a you know a fold, and that means that this made a sudden change, and then this will not blend because it's just too sudden a change. Remember the local value and the line and the right angle and all of that business. Then there's, of course, one object in front of the other. One just simply does not share space with the other. Even though they're stacked, students think they can blend them. They're not. They're not of the same value. This is one of the more major types of edges right here. And it's it, it catches the eye right away. Yes, we're going to blend the crap out of it, but it still catches the eye. It's still the distinction between face and everything else. And in a portrait, that's all it is, face and everything else. And if for some reason you're throwing me off with these anatomically inaccurate kind of deformities, uh, me as the viewer, I'm just going to see either the artist is sloppy, is unusually um, uh, just you know not interested in these edges, even though the eye anatomy is intact. So what is it that's holding you back with these? So I'm serious about you fixing these. I'm putting you on the spot. Um, same thing again. I'm just going to see how awkward it is when the inner eyebrow is not smudged. Even in the reference, even in the reference, it's not that sharp. And the only time it'll be that sharp is if they actually painted in their eyebrows. Remember that 15%, 5%, 30%, that's not across all paintings. 15% smudge does something very different to a low resolution painting than a high resolution painting. Make sure every single percentage is different per painting. So I'm actually going to drop to 5% to get what I need, even though before 5% was doing nothing on the previous painting because it was higher resolution. All right, So you have to be able to figure that out. This is all negative space. Um, the size of the lower eyelids is a bit too big, is it not? But for some reason it's very charming. It's still working for the painting. I'm just going to kind of thicken out the waterline. It feels missing considering the lower eyelid is so huge that the waterline is so undone. And in this painting, when, when I say there's a certain level of caricature um, in every painting you ever draw, unless you're doing photorealism, somehow, some way, you're doing an interpretation of the measurements. They're still the measurements. I promise you they're still intact. You still need to do them. But there will still be some stuff that might be off, especially, especially when you start eyeballing and you're well into and advanced your measurement system and your awareness of trend lines. Uh, you'll, you'll still kind of skew stuff a little bit on purpose. And that'll be your taste. So if you enlarge eyes naturally, if you enlarge chins, if, you, if, you, if some, for some reason the character has a certain feature, you'd love to exaggerate it. Everyone has a certain level of caricature in their work. Um, and you kind of get away with it. It's fun. So if I were to do her eyes, I would really exaggerate her, the, 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 the mouth size, because she's got a very wide, large mouth. And the distance between her nose and her mouth, I'd kind of exaggerate it just a little bit, and I'd exaggerate her laugh lines. Um, her inner inner waterline, these little, this little bit of makeup here, I'd kind of exaggerate that. So these are the things not, I didn't decide they were prominent. They are prominent. It's just my interpretation of them has decided to make them a little bit more prominent in my version. Um, so yeah, the lower eyelids are charming, but make sure that you are following the rules. So the most outward reaching part of the eye is like the fat belly part. This, this line here, this vertical line, represents the most outward reaching, reaching part of the eye. Anything that is on the outsides has now fallen and sunken underneath the fat. So that means the outward reaching part did fight against the fat and created an edge, but the, pep, the part that sunk back in now has smudges. Out here too, it sunk back in, it has some smudges to it. But out here is where that most outward reaching part caught some light, cast some shadows, and then finally, to complete the charm of the large, squinted lower eyelid, you have to shade radially. 
And again, I just grab my soft brush. Anytime even the word radial pops up in your brain, you know you have to equip with soft brush. You can execute radial shading with a, with a blocking brush, but I would leave that for when you know what to do with a soft brush so that you know what's required and what you can take from your, your hard edge brush. But um, just you, you got to learn to do it the right way before you find other ways of doing it. So cut off the edge here and let's to look at the before after you see that we radially created a pocket I didn't do it everywhere definitely on the not on the parts that are sunken in and I'll show you the before and after and how much completion points we now earn got a bunch of what are they called experience points now all right, and then just like the radial shade, radial is both in value that is positive and negative, dark and white. And just look at that. Look at that eyeball that has suddenly become an eyeball. You see that? Very, very important. <clears throat> uh, it's back. Radial shading with a blocking brush would be blocking in and then smudging away towards the brightest value, right? Yeah. You're, you're shrinking your brush, you're doing all the stuff you're supposed to do radially, it's just you're doing a blocking brush now, but typically your blocking brush should have some opacity um, uh, transfer to it. It shouldn't always be hard, hard. Um, you shouldn't be trying to radial shade when you're blocking in, because remember, that's all low poly. We discussed that already in the first 30 minutes. You're thinking only hard, uh, uh, clay, just robotic, application of excessive values and polygon um, as a polygon you're not really thinking about radial elevation remember it's about local localization of a certain value range so you're not doing any radial shading in the start of a painting it's only later that you start addressing that and by later you should have evolved outside of your blocking bl brush and something into something in between soft and blocking or at least you know just cutting your opacity in half at least for the same brush which is what I do all right, so you see that radial shade? I really want you to see the difference. Like we popped it out, popped it back in. <laughs> um, like, you know, the plastic, you know, when hard plastic gets like, like a bottle. I have no idea what I'm saying. All right, so any questions regarding this? Any aha moments? Okay, so then after that, we have another little window, like another little flap of skin right underneath, which is something very... I would exaggerate again because she's got very dark values under here. That's not makeup. Makeup doesn't exaggerate flaws. Um, so this is a natural, beautiful human thing, and I, want, I love exaggerating it. Exactly the same thing. It's a tiny, tiny little untraceable radial shade drop. See that? So it actually reads as a pocket. Look at all these experience points we just developed. And just like there is dark and light, there's a little bit of light right above that I'm exaggerating. What Link did here is it's not the same girl, but it's the same science, right? It's not the same girl, but he used this light environment to create someone else. This is exactly what I love seeing. Uh, this is exactly the kind of back and forth, push and pull development of, of taste and beauty taste that I love to see um, students do. You don't have to copy the reference. We use references so that we can memorize lighting environments and scenarios. We choose references wisely so that they reinforce our opinion of beauty and help us develop a go-to portrait that we're known for. Um, but I love when that all that is happening at once. Okay, and then I'm just going to thicken her eyebrows. So what happened here, and then I'm gonna smudge that radial smudge on the outskirts of the painting. So what happened here is that you flattened it inward with the eyebrow, and what you did there is that you flattened the brow bone. So we're doing this to get the brow bone volume back. See that, we're showing a circular, as if, as if the edge of the eyebrow was a contour line. Okay, so Link, be very careful with this line here that you have. The eyes are beautiful, what you're doing is beautiful. But be careful with that line. Um, she does have very deep set eye sockets, but remember that fatty part of the eyeball, the most sticky outy part? Well, that's out here. Everything else is a degree sunken into the head again. This is the most sticky outy part. <laughs> See 
so many aha moments. Good, 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 good. You keep losing the brow bone, make sure you get it back. We need a little bit of it left. The brow bone is this big, beautiful patch right here. So for everyone who's been staring at these annoying, I know you get sick of them, I know. Um, I see these portraits over and over and over again with my students. But what I like to teach students is that I know you've been staring at this photograph for a month now doing homework for Patreon, but don't you find that you've now rediscovered the portrait all over again? It's like the first time you've seen this photo. Because suddenly there's all this new detail there you hadn't picked up on before or you just saw it, but now that you've seen it described through paintbrush and paint brush strokes, you kind of have a new appreciation for the amount that you can pick up off one single photo. And then I'm going to do, see how distracting the edges of the face, especially because it's black, and I chose this one on purpose. It's, it's, it's a lot of black surrounding the portrait. And so we're going to drop down into 1% and just smudge away. I do have to do the radial drop. It doesn't matter which one comes first, honestly. And then I do the radial drop. As soon as you say radial, you think soft brush, low opacity, high feed, pure black shrinking my brush as I go. So the fa face descends back in. Again, same thing with the nose. Students are having troubles with noses. Um, the septum in this case is just a little bit lower than the nostril, so nostril line, septum line. Um, yours is kind of leveled, so be very, very careful with that. Uh, because of time constraints, if I don't get to your homework, I hope that you guys are still attempting to uh, now apply these corrections as much as possible, but I will try to get to everyone. Okay, so before, I f after. Yours looks a little bit angry, which is what I like. I like when there's a bit of emotion that you're interpreting. Some see angry and stern, some see playful, some see uh, graceful, some see more of a uh, like a like a tomboy. Everyone sees it differently. Everyone has a different kind of character they'd use this face on. Um, and again, that's how the how, that's how you should be picking your references. All right, before, after. I I recommend all of these corrections. <clears throat> there isn't a correction I apply or or, or recommend that is optional. Uh, these are all very 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 high. Um, like professionalism corrections. These are this is all the stuff that the professionals do. So it's really not optional. <laughs> so don't go saying, oh, I'll just take one of these and do the rest later. Or I just won't do the rest. No, do them all. Try them all, at least once, so that you can understand that they have a role, a solid role. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this piece, uh, same thing. The eyebrows. But thank you to everyone who followed the rules and showed me their blocking. Uh, a lot of you did so well, and I, I made it necessary and mandatory because I, I want you to see that you are so capable of success if you gave your sciences just a bit more time. And the people that just didn't realize how well they could draw if they just measured a little bit better and how much, because the thing is, you don't know how much you have left to improve on until you get measurement out of the way. Measurement is not something you improve on or decide on or get better at. Measurement is something you do, period. Whether you're a math person or not, whether you're an architecture person or not, it doesn't matter who you are. Measurement is math. Measurement is measurement. It's not even counting. It's just pure angles and, and, and just letting the symmetry line show you what you haven't been able to see. So. Once you get that out of the way, you can really tell where you do have understanding issues. There's no understanding um, uh, block or obstacle that has to do with measurement. You either do it or you don't. Um, and then you eventually can just do it without thinking. Uh, but light on form, that's something that takes understanding. Uh, focal point, that's something that takes understanding. So get the stupid, you know, silly stuff out of the way that you can just cross off your list simple shopping list of stuff and focus on the stuff that really requires thought. Okay, so I'm smudging again and uh, eye size is a bit large. Measurement could have really helped you create better focal. Um, one eye is significantly lower than the other. 
Um, if you did do measurement and this escaped you somehow, maybe during rendering you lost it, you need to toggle your layers, uh, measurement layers on and off as you work. You kind of missed out on the on the gaze and you, you've heard me all, all session talk about how it's all about the gaze and you meet someone while look at, looking at them and <laughs> you can't meet someone if their eyes are crossed. It just feels off. You don't know which eye to look at. You don't know how they're talking to you. You can't read gestures. You can't read expression that well. When someone has that issue or that disability, it's hard to tell what they're saying. It's hard to tell which eye they're expressing with. That's what you're doing to your painting. That's what you're do saying about your painting. If there is a crossness to the eye, you're missing out on familiarity. And I've talked about this before. When the eye is messed up in any kind of way, um, if there is something hiding it, if there is excessive shadow in the whites, that means mystery and you're instantly accessorizing with villain, um, instantly. So before, after. All right, just like it's not even a style. I'm not even taking anything away from your painting. It's literally something holding back your painting for no reason. Look at how much measurement was holding you back. And that's what keeps the intermediate from an advanced. Um, but good job on your blocking. This is exactly why you don't have any major language issues. The values are dark where they need to be. The values are light where they need to be. I think you read this so well. Apart from this issue, which could have been a flipping thing, um, I think you did have a flipping problem. Beautiful job on delaying the pupils. I love that. I, I really love that. I hope you used a hard round brush for the stencil. Um, a nice job on the hair, but uh, smudging is, is what's going to complete the rest. Large brush work alone is still keeping behind. Really hard edge brush tails. See, those are pretty hard. They're existing even, I can see the edge even zoomed in. You shouldn't be able to see an edge zoomed in. That's how you know an edge is an edge, when you can still see it zoomed in. When you zoom in, it should have turned into a gradient. Um, but it needs to be turned back into a gradient here. Focus needs to be redirected. I kind of smudge even a little bit more on a temple, because there's even more funny little hairs in that area. I'm kind of overdoing it just for the demonstration. But... Oh. All right, see that? So, before, after, All right? So these are not optional. This is the stuff that the pros do. I want you to guys, uh, I want you guys to start doing it. It's not um, uh, a matter of taste. It's not a matter of style. It's just how you, it's just staging, it's cinematics, it's presentation. It, it assists you in, in showing off your painting. This is the smudging that we did because it was a black backdrop. So if you're working with a light backdrop, there's not much smudging you can do on the edge of the face. Sometimes you're going to have a hard value, period. Why? Because there's so much light to go around. You can have edges that kind of enter into the, uh, to the edges of the canvas. Um, but of course, the brush size should keep you. The brush size should still enlarge towards the outside edges of the canvas. Um, and, uh, and on all that. So I'm just going to smudge the ears. And just what happens to the focal point is really the best. And then again, same thing, 1% foot around the eyes. And that makes them feel a little bit less lasso and a little bit more human. Good job on the nose, probably one of the best noses we've seen today because everything is in its designated spot. Uh, though I'd love to see some harder edges around the nostrils, Nostrils are still deep cavities, so look at it, it's a, just as black as the pupil. These are called the dark spots, they really need to be intact. And now from a distance it looks like a photo. Hope you all continue this uh, blocking pattern. It, it's, it's just it's still going to happen even though, you're still going to do it even though it's, it's you're not going to think, you're just going to be doing it, you're not going to notice, maybe you're going to notice yourself doing it. Um, be careful with the white backdrop. This whole time we've been talking about maintaining values and making sure we're interpreting the right values and you're not going to be able to do that with this super, super dark um, like local backdrop light environment and then all of a sudden this pure white. Y your working room, you don't have to work in a lab room, in a white lab. Um, you don't have to work like that. <clears throat> so what that did was it 
I think it made you misinterpret some of your values. Like looking looking at the, the, the forehead. Look at the forehead and look back at the reference. Look at how much white you had. Uh, look at the cheekbones. You made it seem like you painted this in midday. This seems like it's a night scene or a closed... Um, a kind of like in a cave but it's but it's overcast outdoors but she's in some kind of shelter here it feels like she's in a sunny but kind of stormy day that's because the shadows aren't dark do you see what I'm saying so when you had that white backdrop it really didn't let you interpret your light environment a light environment is what time of day is it and what's nearby to reflect that time of day on my object and what is the object saying about the nearby environment and the time of day it's three-parter. Light environment is background, light source, and object. And that white background was really throwing you off. So try to apply all the smudging we did today, but not before you go back and assess whether or not these elevations really are elevations. You made the cheeks have the same value as the nose. That's that's not what this, this photograph is describing. And looking back at Link's work, we saw that, hey, you can take back as much of the likeness as you want. You can make up your own. What you are memorizing is the light environment. This is a building. And what you're taking back is the description. So that white background, look at what it made. Just you completely didn't see. This is valley. And this is the top of the mountain. And you inter interpreted both with value sharing. Value sharing isn't just about dark values. It's about giving light values to inappropriate altitudes or not synced altitudes. Okay. And then in this piece, um, same thing, but... We're kind of, I'm not sure if you uh, uploaded your work. Homework submission for Nerea. Um, Nerea, yes, they did. They did upload their work. Okay. Um, all right. So what I'm not seeing here is blocking. There's no blocking. The success rate for students who blocked according to our homework today is high. Everyone who blocked had pretty much a good idea of what they were doing when it came to their values. They created borders between. This is an interpretation of the form. You don't interpret form. Write that, write that back. You, you don't interpret form ever, which is why we block, which is why we measure, which is why all of this happened today. We never interpret form. The way to minimize your interpretation of form is to block, is to create specific outlines of local values and localize uh, specific areas along one value that can summarize them and represent them the best. You don't have any real description between the massive amount of dark down here that's required and the change between this value and the cheek area, this value, Okay, how about this edge right here? These are all areas that could have helped you. Then we have another other sub values here and here. Okay, and then this right here. These are missing blocks and you need to get on those right away. Doesn't matter how well you drew anything else. If these are not intact and you draw well, you probably draw better than anyone you know. You draw, you probably draw the best in your group. But it's just, why did this happen? And it's because there were a lot of sciences that are missing. So you see, Anton, pertaining to your question earlier, this is another example of measurement. Blocking is measurement. You're measuring values, just like you're measuring likeness and anatomy, just like you're measuring a symmetry and what it makes a human human. This is not something you can interpret, just like you can't interpret the measurements that go back all the way that predate all the way back to when humans started to first look like humans, actual skeletal measurement. So in blocking, you're measuring value, and um, and and you have to be able to to, to 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 pull this off in your early stages. I have a feeling you're the type of artist who details right away. Uh, look at your. This is not blocking here. You're still painting. There's still like a, a four or five panels, frames of work till you got here. What were they? Um, you had this value running all the way up the forehead. We don't really have that here. We have one value in between the forehead. It has its own values, but the value used on the forehead is similar to the one on the sides of the nose. This is a completely different country. Imagine this is 
Canada and this is the U.S. and this is South America, Mexico, all that. It's a different borders altogether. They don't even have the same laws. They're completely different from each other. They have their own rules, own angles. They have their own relationship with the light source. And this looks nothing like this, but if you're looking back at other students, you can tell that it's all building up to the same face. So, Nerea, please spend more time blocking. I'm going to give out another assignment this month, and I need to see that you have applied everything that you learned today in your new assignment. Okay, but good job on the eyes. Likeness is beautiful. I need you to smudge the way you, you need to do, uh, according to what we did today. Um, but I can't talk about smudging, can I, on your piece, if blocking is so minimal. You cannot smudge till you block. Write that back. <clears throat> um, so actually, I'm going to save this, and then I'm just going to finish off uh, with some more pieces. So what I wanted to talk about this here is in the reference, we actually have a very, very sharp... This is something that I kind of handpicked on purpose, because look at how sharp that is. And some of you, even though the freckles were there, and I put the freckles there on purpose to see how they might throw off your interpretation of the values and the blocking, but let me just, uh, this was actually pretty sharp. This would, ha this would be one of the only times you don't smudge. And if you guys remember, you never smudge around the nose anyway. So if you're smudging around the nose, you are doing, um, you are representing that you can store fat in the nose, which is impossible. That'd be really weird. Um, no, you cannot store fat in the nose. Um, and nose can swell, but it can't store actual pockets of fat, which means there's nothing to relieve the geometry, which means a lot of your initial brush strokes remain in their common denominator geometric anatomy that they represented all the way to the ends of the painting. Um, so this is one of the only times that you actually, this face is so strong but gentle at the same time. It's really, really beautiful. Um, and it was some, somewhat of a challenge. You have two major edges happening at the same time, one object in front of the other. This had to be an unforgiving edge right around here that the freckles are relieving a bit. And one is an angle change. Remember, it doesn't always have to fold in it can fold out the paper. Okay, uh, so that's what I wanted to discuss here. Um, about the eyes, the eyes feel like we're, we're kind of, it's a bit confusing, but especially for the lower eyelids, we're seeing more of one side slightly than the other. This is a shorter line than here, whereas here it's the same size line twice over. So this should have been thinner lower eyelid into thicker. That way it would have looked like a three-quarter view a little bit more. Okay, so I'm sure you guys have seen already the challenge uh, uh, critique hour. Um, so, oh, shoot, one second, let me just grab some water. Okay. So the challenge critique hour that we did um, discuss a lot about gesture, characterization through gesture, light environment, making sure that the design felt a little bit more synced throughout the painting. Uh, so some of you, are, obviously you guys were allowed to work outside of, of Aztec, um, but uh, when you do do that, like when you do that, you shouldn't be depending on your creativity to pull a read. So let's talk about Breath of the Wild, for example. They had so much creativity in the way they were going to interpret Breath of the Wild. Ocarina of Time didn't really give them a designated culture to work from. If anything, it was a Germanic culture, you know, like Germanic castles and old age castles from Europe and stuff like that. Very, very European armor structure, very European lore and, and, and um, the marketplace. It's all very, none of it is like uh, tribal or anything. But when they did decide to go tribal, they said, okay, we'll keep all of the castle-like stuff. We'll keep all the English-type type castles. Um, sorry, one sec. Oh, I thought I was going to sneeze. Um, we'll keep all of the English-type castles. Um, we'll keep all of that, but we will introduce a new 
cultural addition. I'm not really talking about other cultures of Hyrule, just the castle culture. Um, they introduced the magic aspect to it, which was, in lack of a better term, recognizable. So you, they didn't use the creativity excuse as the culture. So which games do that? There's a lot of games that mess around like that, that, that kind of do their own, like Final Fantasy, let's say. We have no idea where Final Fantasy creators are pulling their costume designs from. Like, we have no idea <laughs> what the heck they're doing. Which culture kind of like, talks, you know, this, which culture is it they're pulling? Sometimes they're wearing genie like your uh, Arab Peninsula type um, uh, short coats and long pants and all of that. And then at one point, characters are wearing short jeans, and it's hard to tell which age it is. It's hard to tell what's the norm it's hard to tell what the denominator culture is so when we're designing characters you can be as creative as possible um without looking like a um uh, you know like creative desperation like you're grabbing at everything um so you find a culture and you choose from it it's hard for me to tell where this culture is coming from you've got very arabian style um, kind of like uh, mystic kind of designs and yes the alien all the magic is synced that's I like that but then we're looking at this and then I'm thinking Babylonian or Egyptian and then I'm thinking of the hair and I think of Egyptian again um, but I'm not sure what this is pulling from this is a very specific shape uh, so it, you have to be able to sync all that if you're going for Egyptian you should probably, because it's such a distance, distant render, complete all of the Egyptian aesthetics so you can read them a little bit better. Distance render means that you are trying to make a, a read from a distance. So if you guys think like games, let's say um, World of Warcraft, uh, there's a reason why the shoulder blades, uh, the shoulder pads are massive, is because you're playing the character zoomed out. And a character that's zoomed out with some armor on just looks like a triangle walking around. But they added these massive shoulder blades and suddenly it looked, they expanded the triangle and the read happened even more from a distance and this person looked even more intimidating. For females, this is like a pretty healthy kind of female body fit with curves. But again, in games we see stuff like tiny, tiny waist, massive hips, and head. This would cons be considered obese in our real world. This is massive. Uh, this is unusual. Plus, this is not possible. And I'm sure you've seen what corsets do to bodies. But in characterization and from a distance read, this is acceptable. This is acceptable. This is ridiculous if you've ever seen the cosplay attempts <laughs> for, well, the quote, Warcraft cosplay. Um, so what I'm saying is, make the eyes massive. If you're going to be talking about a character that is from the top, to bottom, visible, character, turnaround, design, plus culture that has to read from a distance and not look ridiculous and not look detailed the way you can detail in a portrait because it's so zoomed up, uh, you have to exaggerate. So the waist is great. I have no problem with the body. It really feels athletic. Um, it's just the face doesn't read as um, a beautiful temptress type of uh, 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 you know, athletic, um, mystical, chosen one from the underground come to save the nation. I want something that is a little bit more fantastical. She's described as a goddess. No matter the culture you're choosing, she's described as a goddess. So you want to exaggerate. You want to make it larger than life. And this is what you want to do with your characterization zoom when you're doing zoom outs. You want to exaggerate what is making the read happen. If she's Egyptian, Make the eyes bigger, use the triangular, large eye, small nose, small mouth. Give us an even more stylized kind of description of what's happening to the eyes. Give us something even, maybe like that, it looks like a scorpion now. That would have been something cool. It doesn't have to be both eyes. Um, anything, anything to kind of help us read it from a distance. Because it's no longer a portrait, it's no longer about the nuances. Um, <laughs> don't disrespect the thickness. Um, of course, yeah, you can join, James. Okay, uh, so for this, I love your midtones. I think you kind of took the whole midtone lesson um, to heart. I love that. Uh, make sure you still have a read, though. The body's reading is very masculine. It feels like a male, uh, and that's because of the way the waist is not really feminine. 
uh, enough. Be careful with the, the, the placement of the shoulder. That seems a bit high uh, for something. So let me show you. I'll, I'll disable this is a great trick. You disable the uh, area. Um, just stay you know, away from it for a while. Paint, do whatever you want, and then show it off again. And you notice that it's way too high. It should have been somewhere down here. Um, and everything else should have been filled in accordingly. So the shoulder doesn't really lift up unless she's kind of pulling the, the, the string. And even then, it really wouldn't have done all that. It would have, it, it, unless the, if, if the bow is up here, then her shoulder would be up there. But the bow is low, so the arm is being pulled down anyway. Um, so it wouldn't be doing what you think you'd be doing. So you have a balanced shoulder. It's very difficult to get asymmetrical shoulders. Um, you really have to be doing some kind of excessive, um, I'm only saying that now because of my, my back problem, but yeah, you have to be like forcing yourself into, into the, uh, the pose. So I'm just going to complete the rest and then show you the before. Not sure what I'm reading here. Um, and if the arm is being pulled, oops, my bad, if the arm is being pulled, it's kind of doing that and that. So it's kind of being pulled forward, just like so. If she is like holding a, a string or something like that, so it feels a little bit more natural. <clears throat> And that should kind of sum it up for today. I'm going to be looking at really quickly at everyone else's, but um, I thank everyone who showed their work. Who, the more you, that you respond to the call for the assignment, the more detailed and the more opportunities you guys have for aha moments, for details that I can reveal to you. So your education is invested entirely in your application. All I have right now is the knowledge. What you do after the class is whether or not you improve. Your improvement is in your response to the knowledge. Um, so the call to kind of be there, the call for assignments, is really important in developing and, 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 and you know, creating for yourself an opportunity to respond and actually see improvement in your work. That's all about results, and anything that promises results is what we pursue. Anything that helps us no longer be the artist we are today is what we want to pursue. So before, a little bit of an awkward position there. And you can really explore so much without investing too much rendering power just with your sketches, uh, which leads me to these. I love these sketches, but only as working lines. I don't see much, uh, we talked about this in one of our, yeah, in our first critique together in the patron critiques. Um, we talked about how we have uh, uh, you know, just lot, lots and lots of working lines, lots of shapes that you can use that help you describe angle and perspective and all of that. And I don't see much of these. I see some of it over here, um, but uh, the lines are very messy. The reason why we have working lines is so that the last lines that we have are very clean. They have a direction. Um, and one exercise I give my students is I tell them to make many pieces, many many dots in a screen in a, in a canvas, and try to connect them all as fast as you can, um, in different patterns, and that kind of improves your brush skill. These points will one day be points of render, points of um, whatever the pose is going to be, and your final lines will have to combine all of that. The more detail you do, the more points of the, the more points you can hit the more clean your shape is. Um, so you guys need to do this exercise yeah, exactly if you want to perfect how clean your lines are. And a clean line is a fast line. And if you're sitting there hovering away, trying to figure out anatomy as you complete the painting, as you characterize, you're going to get lines that look like this, which are beginner lines. And this is not another one of those understanding moments. This is something you cross off your list, just like measurement. This is, there is understanding and knowing which shape to use for which kind of gesture, but um, it's not uh, optional um, uh, whether or not you apply this to your application. It's not something that needs a couple weeks of thinking or meditation. It's practice your lines and get better lines. It's just like driving. Practice your driving so that you can figure out what you're doing with your car. It has nothing to do with your drawing anymore and everything to do with your hand weight, your brush, whether or not your pen pressure is right, are you using the right brushes, 
um, the tilt of your canvas, the height of your table compared to your elbow, um, how you're tilting your canvas, uh, your 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 canvas, and tilting your tablet and holding your pencil. Is your arm heavy? These are all things outside of the painting, just like measurement is. Um, these are all things that are out in the um, non-artistic, non-creative aspect that needs to be addressed. There's a lot of non-creativity, as you know, that you're responsible for, and this is just the sciences. Um, so do this exercise some more um, for the person who drew this, please, and um, figure out what shapes you want to use. And if once you're done doing this messy stuff, you can lower the opacity and try some cleaner lines on top. But do not... Um, assume that those clean lines are also going to be line art lines. They can still be messy, they can still be sketchy. They don't have to be line art. Okay, um, so I'm just going to flatten this. And I have a public class now that I have to go to. Um, but all of this still applies. Um, I might look at these next time. I might throw these into our critique hour today. I might, um, actually I wanted, I wanted to talk about this for, I can just have it for 5.30. Anton, I need you to watch that eye study uh, because what's happening here is a brow bone and a edge for the, uh, this eye sag that is just way too exaggerated. Uh, so where we would smudge here would all be all the way like up we would smudge this much because it's this is not stuff we're seeing okay so these unusual new pieces of anatomy felt like we were drawing that you know those people from that was that was from that movie what's that movie called with the alien Prometheus you know those really really bulky looking alien people that's kind of what it felt like you, you weren't working with human anymore you were working with something else um, so please be careful with that um, don't uh, represent anatomy that is from your working lines as anatomy. It's just planning lines that help you create and dictate borders between each feature, but they don't they're not lines that stay um, uh, for the entirety of the, of the of the render. They just don't. So this is some big stuff that you had left over that you really, really didn't need. It was hard to tell if it was masculine because of the heavy brow, but obviously not. Um, so all that had to go away. No, no, I will try to get to everyone today um, as much as I can. Uh, this line dependency here is not what you get. It's not what you keep when you're trying to illustrate in a scene. So if you are trying a turnaround for potential animated, this is perfect for that uh, because you have blocky values, consistent midtones. But if you wanted to animate this and you're doing a design character turnaround or character lineup for an animated character design or whatever you're going to use it for, don't try to turn it into an illustration. Make it a gray background. This is just a character that we're going to be animating. It's not currently being animated. This is just the design. Um, even the animation style might change. The legs are a little bit masculine and bulky. Again, we're missing a feminine attitude to the, to the body. We're not really having much. And when one leg is lifted and straight, uh, if one leg is lifted, the hip goes down, which means that one leg is lifted with the hip being up. So you kind of missed out on that. Um, I think you really, really need that. Um, if you have Portrait Studio pose there, you can just do a simple Google search and you can have that. Um, I, I could open it up right now and pose it for you, but we are running out of time. But please remember that any kind of character that is no longer walking, you have instantly thrown off the symmetry and you just got to do it. Get off your couch and stand up and you'll see that you are um, incapable of balancing if your leg is lifted up for too long. That should show in your painting. So if you're having trouble figuring out how what happens to the body once the symmetry is thrown off, try it yourself. The body compensates in some other way and leans in some other way where the line of balance is no longer uh, balanced on either side, the same amount on either side. If she's standing straight, yeah, it would be. This would be a mirror reflection. But the body does some stuff like shifts the head over to one side because suddenly everything is heavy on the other side. 
and if this leg is lifted and not lifted up, this one is flat and straight. You can't have two legs that are kind of completely out of you know, your fall. Um, these are all the nuances that you pick up out of referencing and the mileage in referencing. And not only that, looking at videos of someone walking and seeing what's happening in their, in their body. Um, over here I talked about this. Um, it's, it's again another description of the long triangular upper body, um, the small upper body and the large lower body is what we need in order to read a female because comparing the two it was very very manly before. If it wasn't for the breasts it would look like a man, a male uh, uh, kind of like silhouette and then you can exaggerate the breasts if you need to to get that back. She can still be athletic and still have this body type especially if she's kind of packed um, with like all kinds of insulation. So uh, what I would want to see is just you continuing this. I love this kind of wintry um, just like a like a wintry landscape. I feel like we're looking at something Native American or something northern or Norse. I'd love to see where you took it. Maybe a helmet. That would have been really great. Be careful with the white background. And I'd love to see some working lines as well, exploring large shapes. Maybe that large um, helmet is going to change the silhouette completely and make it look busy. You need to include all the components that you're going to be using. Um, view. Uh, oops, let me see. Show. Uh, where is it? Guides. There we go. Why, why wasn't there a clear guides option? Um, this is beautiful. I feel like her face is a little bit too small uh, for her head. You can't really tell till you do it because she's looking all the way up. So before her face felt very, very small compared to her. You just have to compare her nose and her face to her breast area or to her feet. It just looked like very small. Do you see what I'm saying? So we kind of just enlarged her face to kind of match. The head was good size. The head was great. It's the face that was kind of throwing you off. And that's because of the hairline sometimes. So be careful with that. Um, I like the gesture of the hair braid. But it feels like it has a mind of its own. A braid that thick is a heavy braid. So this was an opportunity for you to have a straight line um, because you have all the curvy here. And you have another curvy here. So which curvy is the one we're supposed to be looking at? And these are the type of questions you answer when you have only black against white. Um, so if you have a white background, black character, you can really tell what you're doing. I think it's because you added detail here that you kind of lost it. So a straight braid would have been a beautiful kind of, as if her hair is like a um, kind of reminder of the, um, the, the, the arrow. So straight hair, and these are trend lines again, against a curvy bow, that would have been wonderful. And then the curvy body in front of that. All right, so this is what we explore in our silhouette stage. This is what I'd love to see you guys try as much as possible. Um, good job on the leg, though it feels like she's lifted her ankle, but her leg is still on the same level. If she's lifted her ankle, her toe has come out, and, and uh, yeah, just a little bit lower on the horizon line. Oopsie. <clears throat> and then I'm going to talk about this one. Um, so this is, oh, this is the same one we were looking at. Okay. Okay, so I'd love to see some snow, but um, this is cool. Um, another example of a face that is too small, and this is the hairline again, but not just the hairline. If you have other props, they kind of throw off your ability to measure how much you need. So the, 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 the kind of headband would have kind of hidden her um, forehead, her, some of her eyebrows. See how small the face was? It's okay if you feel like you don't have the skills, but now you know what it is that you need to be pursuing. And that's what a masterpiece is good for. But once you're done with that, that's what you go back to when you write, go right back to the sandbox environment of grayscale. Okay? And then flatten that and send it. And that's it for today. Um, I hope today's lesson helped you guys. I hope you guys picked up a thing or two. Um, from all of this stuff that we've covered. We've covered quite a bit of stuff. I have the recording, don't worry, I promise. 
I will be submitting it. I don't have time for questions. I'm happy that I was answering as I went uh, because I have public session now that I'm late for. Um, but uh, I will be posting this month's assignment. And I just want to thank you all again uh, for being patrons and for joining in this apprentice program and uh, for giving me an opportunity to teach you. Um, I do encourage all of you, I know you're here for support and everything, but I encourage you to take advantage and do the lessons, do the assignments. You'll find yourself improving so much so quickly because it's not going to be an assignment that you do on your own. It's not something that you did by yourself. You're part of a community now and a very specific small community, so you have even more chance to get some attention from your peers and get critiques. Um, and it doesn't mean don't go to the popular community, the, the populated community, but um, still here is an opportunity for you to, to really hone in on some of the problems you have. So uh, I, I encourage you to join them. I encourage you to do them all. Uh, you'll find something to work on, find something to improve that you can sleep on, and just by knowing it's there, you'll improve on it because you'll know what you're looking for. Uh, so I'll let you guys go. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great day, guys. Bye.